On this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino, we preview the OU Arizona matchup in the Alamo Bowl, and we give you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's a beautiful Tuesday, December 26th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match, Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of December, all you got to do is visit Riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now we're recording this on Tuesday morning. Please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. Have a good Christmas, Ted. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Just the best. It's great. Had some family in town. Very good. How about you? Uh, my son now has approximately, I don't know, 300 toy cars. Just <laughs> insane. The collection he has accumulated is just, we, we, we got to do something. My my house is being overrun by toy cars. It's like a it's like a minefield for my feet in our living room currently. It's it's a dangerous situation. We got to do something oh, about it. Great. No, but it was awesome. It was fantastic. Oh, that's good. That's good. Nothing wrong with loving cars, man. Car junkie that could get expensive later. Yeah, we'll see. Now, hope you guys all had an awesome Christmas out there. But let's let's jump into the OU stuff. And before we preview the Alamo Bowl, some transfer portal news just a reminder the portal giveth and the portal take it sooner's got a commitment from north texas transfer offensive lineman fabechi wee woo i believe that's how it's pronounced wee woo in w-a-i-w-u now i went and watched a lot of his tape because duh <laughs> here are my notes Appears to have all the physical tools to be a really good guard. Looks thick in the lower half. I think he can come in and is instantly OU's best-looking offensive lineman for his position. Uh, looks like an SEC guard. Footwork is efficient. Gets his cleats in the ground, but plays with high pads. Got to get his pads down. Uh, Beanbow will teach him to use his length in pass pro. He does not use his hands as weapons in pass protection. He catches too much he must learn to use his hands independently in pass protection he was only a two-hand puncher at north texas uh his worst plays on tape are when he appears to be unsure of where he's working to or where his eyes should be and you can almost see him hesitating as a result of that and that gets him in bad spots looks very good pulling from the tackle position which he played he also played some guard he looks very good pulling on the counter concepts that North Texas ran, uh, suffered a bad ankle sprain against Tulane, uh, showed some toughness playing through that, but the tape after he got hurt is not great. I turned on the SMU game first, and I was going, well, what's going on here? So John Cooper, former Sooner, was his offensive line coach at North Texas. I texted him. I said, wait, what? And he said, don't pay attention to that he was he was really banged up the stuff early in the season looks much better uh blitz recognition which includes slanting and angling from the defensive line needs to improve he could play right tackle in a pinch he showed that ability at north texas his anchor is not as good as his lower body build would indicate which is interesting so i think that that is that's something he needs to work on during the offseason, which the offseason is going to be very important for him, clearly. But I do think just looking at his physical makeup, uh, looking at his best plays that I saw from him on film, he is he's definitely a candidate to start at offensive guard for this team next season. 
And is th- th- I'm assuming that is the plan, right? Is, is I guard is for sure where they're wanting to play him, and I would I would assume so. I think he has, as far as his ceiling, it is much higher at guard than it is at tackle. Now you never ha- know how things are going to work out. You know, you always have to, you know, you never plan for injuries, right? But. I think when you look at his physical makeup and the things he's good at, I, I think he's got a he's got a much higher ceiling at the guard position. Yeah, and I I agree with you. He looks definitely looks the part. He's got good size, and um, it's strange that he. I don't know if, if you know much of the story, but it's pretty wild that he was a walk on to North Texas. Uh, I don't know how, because what he go to Coppell? How did he get? How did he get missed in, <laughs> you know, in, in everything? And he walked on, ended up a starter, and it must have the transition must have happened pretty quickly. Yeah, so we'll see. But just talking to, you know, his offensive line coach from this season, thinks if he corrects a couple things, that he can be a pretty special player at the guard spot, especially. So mm-hmm. definitely intriguing. Very, yeah. very intriguing. So we'll, we'll see how it comes together for him in winter workouts, uh, spring ball, training camp, that whole thing. But when you just look at him, the guy looks like an SEC guard. Yeah. Now it's it's time for Bill Beanboat to get him to play like an SEC guard. So uh, I'm excited about the raw materials, and, and I trust Beanboat to uh, – to mold him, if you will. So yeah. I I was a little skeptical when I saw it, but then I went and watched and I was like, okay, there's there's some potential here. So right. I know that some OU fans weren't exactly over the moon about it, but I think when you look at the traits that you know if he if he puts the proper work in, he could be he could be a player. Yeah. Well. That's good. I mean, it's not a, it's not a, a like a Walter Rouse that is a total plug and play. You know exactly what you're going to get, but there's some, some good upside there. I like it. Yeah. I would say he reminds me of Caden Green. He honestly does. And I'm not just <laughs> yeah. saying that because I know Caden's, you know, going out, he's coming in. But when you look at the size, the length, he doesn't have the natural power that Caden Green had when it came to moving guys in the run game, but there's some similarities there from a build uh, and and kind of a ceiling perspective, but there, there's no doubt we was, he's got to put some work in. I mean, he's got to, he's got to get stronger. Uh, He has to, he has to learn to use his hands better, especially in pass protection, but there, there's a lot to like, man, with some of the flashes that he's displayed. Now it's, it's time to get him to play at a high level consistently. Yeah. So yeah. I'm excited to see what it looks like because I think he's, he definitely is going to be a guy that I would expect to play in OU's first SEC season. So we'll see, but there's a lot to like, man. That's good. We need it. We we need the interior offensive line guys to start showing up and competing. So it's good. Yeah. Alamo Bowl time. It feels like forever ago that OU (laughs) played a football game. And now they're they're already down in San Antonio getting ready for this one. Ted, let's start on the defensive side of things. What are you looking for from OU's defense against Arizona's offense? Yeah, Arizona's offense is they're really good. They've got the the number 17 total offense. In the country, they've got the number 12 passing offense in the country, um, led by Fafita, the quarterback from Tonga. He's he's quick, he's efficient, he's accurate with the football. Uh, I don't know that he doesn't overwhelm you with arm strength, just making crazy throws. He just throws it to the right guy on time and on target. I mean, and there's a lot can be said about that. And he's got some good players surrounding him. Um, you know, and they 
they get a lot of it started in the run game. You know, their their offense, and I, I was talking with you about this uh, a while back, but it's got a different feel to it. It's got like an NFL pro style feel to it. Now, it's a college offense, and they still do a lot of college things, but, you know, they'll get under center. They'll run, they'll run stretch. They'll run like some offset eye, and then they have like a, like what looks like a pro style play action off of it with, you know, the extended arm out and taking the deep drop with the, the route progression downfield. Um, but you know, the run game, you don't get a whole lot, but they're efficient at what they do inside zone, split zone stuff, just like you see from everyone else. And they really like the one back power and you'll get that out of shotgun stuff and that you'll get it under center. They'll run one back power under center. Uh, they'll run stretch from under center. Um, you know, it's it's pretty much, I don't want to, I mean, I don't mean to say this in a derogatory term, but it's basic. Like, they're not, they're not going to throw, at least they haven't thrown a lot of different things at you in a given week, like, say, a Kansas or someone like that does. It's fairly simple, but they're efficient in in how they use it. Their backs, I think, are, they got three backs, and I think they're all really good. Coleman, he's their number three. Coleman, he's their their leading back, leading rusher. Averages seven yards a carry, six point nine yards a carry, which is really good. Um, DJ Williams, uh, you know, he's a he's a big, thick guy. Both Coleman and Williams are two hundred fifteen, two hundred twenty pound guys. And then you've got Wiley, number six, who's kind of their change up back and their best receiving back. Uh, he's got five touchdowns receiving 28 receptions. And whenever he's in the game, they'll get it to him a lot of different ways out of the backfield. They'll run like some swing stuff with him, some pick routes, like um, near a bunch formation to where the backer can't get out. They'll run some running back screen stuff to him. So Wiley's their change up guy uh, when they want to get the game, uh, the ball to him. Um, Pass game. One of the things that they do and do a lot and they're really good at are tunnel screens. Um, and I'm not talking about just the the RPO bubble stuff where you throw it outside. These are called tunnel screens where they get the offensive line out, out on the next level. And then, you know, the, the receiver comes in behind in that back behind that big convoy of blockers that gets out. They'll run tunnel screens to wide receivers. They'll run tunnel screens to tight ends. They'll do it to everyone. Empty to running backs out of empty. They'll, you'll see a lot of empty from them, especially whenever they start to get down near the red zone. So uh, they're really good at it. They're efficient. They had one that I, I thought this was, was really cool. They had two backs in the backfield. The H-back was like a, a, a weak offset in in the eye and they had two receivers that were tight and he motions short motion to the two receiver side like they're going to run like a stretch or a toss and then before the snap he picks up his speed and they snap it and he goes out of the core and they run tunnel screen to who originally was the fullback and he comes back against the grain i mean it's a cool design and they ran it to their tight end and their tight end gets heavily involved in the passing game but the real threat in the passing game is McMillan, um, number four, six foot five, 215 pounds, just a really good all around player. He's got 80 catches on the year, 1,242 yards, 10 touchdowns. He is a legit threat. Um, you know, one of the things that I like, they put him on the backside of trips, playing X on the ball, and just run. Uh, one receiver routes. He'll run a comeback. He'll run a slant. He'll run, he'll stem inside, go upfield and run a square in. When he's on the backside of trips, they're just working him one-on-one -on -one with a corner and they like that a lot. Um, now, whenever he's in the formation to the trip side or a two by two, they'll work him over the middle of the field. This is a team that loves crossers. They love deep crossers. They like double crossers from the same side. They like it where there's some mesh stuff underneath with a crosser in behind. 
Uh, they really like to work the middle of the field, and all of their receivers are good at it. Cowling's their number two receiver. He's got 83 receptions. He leads in receptions, not as many yards, but he's a 700-yard receiver with 11 touchdowns. And then Lamonius Craig is a 6'2 athlete, kind of a physical athlete that'll go up and get the football for him. So it's a it's a really good group, good skill position guys, three good backs, three good wide receivers, and a really solid tight end to go with that. Uh, Fafita is he's accurate, he's efficient, he's mobile. They'll run sprint with him. I mentioned the play action stuff. They'll move the pocket. He doesn't run the ball though. He doesn't run the ball a lot, hardly at all. Um, you know, he'll get outside of the pocket and turn some of that stuff into into run, but he's not what I would consider a dual threat quarterback. But 60 or a 73.6% completion, 23 touchdowns, five interceptions. Efficiency is the game with this offense. There's no doubt about it. Now, looking at how OU's defense finished the season, right? And I know that Stutzman was banged up, and but there's there's a lot of momentum on that side of the ball. With Bowman coming back, Stutzman coming back, Terry coming back, Lacey coming back. What what type of performance are you expecting from this group? Because they didn't exactly finish the regular season strong on defense. No, they didn't. I ex I expect this to be a really good defensive performance. Extended amount of time to prepare. And whenever that's the case, I want Venables over pretty much anyone. Um now, the thing that worries me is health at corner. And, you know, with, with the guys that they have, they're going to spread us out. We're going to have to be able to cover. Um, and I do think that Venables is, is probably going to try, and, and he always does to a certain degree, but I think a big part of the game plan is going to be trying to heat up uh, Fafita, bring, bring a bunch of pressure on him. He's a smaller guy. If you can make the pocket chaotic and surround him, can be you know tough for him to get the football out down the field accurately. Uh, I do worry about corner play though. If if Gentry's healthy at corner, makes me feel a little bit better. But uh, that's the one thing I worry about. Outside of that, I think we're as healthy as we've been pretty much all season. I think our defensive line should have a really good game. They're okay. They're, I mean, they're solid on the offensive line. They're going to be missing their best player, their tackle, um, you know, who's a high round draft pick. And, you know, I don't know what they, what they look like behind that, but uh, maybe I'm crazy for, for saying this, but I, I expect to have a really good defensive performance. I do. I mean, we'll see if we can get there. You know, we've got, if we've got, Stutzman fully healthy. We got Bowman, Peyton Bowen, those guys in the secondary healthy other than corner. That's the big worry. We should be healthy across the front. Um, I, I feel good about it. D-line has to play well. Yeah. I mean, that's that's every game, right? But if you can force them, and they've they've had good balance as an offense, especially since Fafita took over, but I, if you can just force them into predictable throwing situations, like you got to like your chances. Fafita, he's good. I mean, he's good. I think his biggest strength is his decision making, his processing. Like he knows where the football is supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Right, basically, right when he catches it, you know, it, it's clear that he is. He can process things quickly. He knows where the ball is supposed to go with the concept that they're trying to execute. But it's going to be hard to get pressure on him with how quick he gets rid of it a lot of the time, which is which is like one of the main notes I had watching their offense is, hey, defensive line, you got to get your hands up. Yeah. And we've had this conversation a lot this year when it comes to the, the lack of sacks that this team, this defense has produced, especially from the defensive line spots. I don't expect him to rack up a big sack total in this game, but what I would like to see is a tip ball or two. Yeah. Bad yeah. things happen for the offense when the ball gets tipped by a defensive lineman. And we, we haven't seen a lot of that this year either, but 
He's not a tall guy. And with how quick he gets rid of it, yet it is one of those situations where it's like, hey, you're not going to be able to get there a lot of the time. Get your hands up. So I yeah. I don't know if I'm trying to manifest a tip ball interception. I think that's what I'm trying to do, though. I think that's what's happening right now. Well, it, it, it'd be good, and it's a good game for it. You know, I, I, I wonder about the blitz. The one thing I wonder about the blitz stuff, which, you know, we, we've got some really good schemes, and we've created a ton of pressure on quarterbacks. Um, they're so good at the tunnel stuff. I, if they catch you at the wrong time in the wrong call, bring in a pressure or something, and they've got a good tunnel set up, they can really make you pay on some of those. And they are good at that. I mean, I would say that that's one of the things that they're best at. They do it out of all kinds of different formations and run it to different players and their offensive line gets out quickly. And those guys are good running behind it. And, you know, it is interesting. They throw, which I don't see hardly anyone else do it. They throw like legit smoke where he's under center, just catches it and throws it to a hitch on the outside. Like you see in the NFL. Um, it's pretty interesting to see that. Cause you just, you don't really see it anywhere else. It's all RPO stuff. So, um, you know, pretty interesting all around. I really just watching and kind of studying their offense. Some, I really like just the flow of it and the style of it has a good feel to it. It's because it looks like an NFL offense. Yeah, that's got a lot to do with it. Yeah, it's got a lot to do. And Jed Fish with his roots and all the time he spent in the NFL makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. Anything else? OU's defense, Arizona's offense. I don't think so. One final question for you. Mm -hmm. And weird things can always happen in a game. What, what point total would you be pleased with OU's defense holding Arizona to? Because this is an offense that did. They have played some good ball in the back half of the season. 21? I think. 24? I think less than three touchdowns. So, like, two touchdowns and chop the rest up however you want. Okay. Like, two or three field goals. Like, so what's that? Um, 23 or below, right? I think. Okay. If you're holding them to field goals, like whatever that tally is, I, it really doesn't end up mattering to me. But, um, you know, because I don't know. I, 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 outside of like some explosive balls downfield to um, uh, McMillan, and be, I, I think that we should be able to, to, to do really well to continue to rally. Make them snap it again. Like we may give up some points, but when we get to the red zone, we've been pretty good. So, I mean, I, 23 and below, I think. That's Those are high expectations it's I know. for an Alamo Bowl. I know it. A lot of points have been scored in this bad boy way over the years. So, we'll, uh, we'll see. I know. All right, let's talk about OU's offense against Arizona's defense. But first... Love's Travel Stops now has 49 RV stops conveniently located at Love's Travel Stops across the country. Love's RV Stops provide RV travelers with a safe, clean, well-maintained, and spacious place to stop on your journey. Whether you need a propane refill, RV dump, private shower, laundry facilities, or a dog park for your furry travel companion, you'll find that and more at Love's RV Stops. Visit lovesrvstops.com to research locations, check availability, and make a reservation for tonight or for months in advance. Visit lovesrvstops.com to make a reservation and find out why Loves is the heart of the highway. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamori. The land doctors have a 120 acre property for sale in East Norman, located just 10 minutes from campus. This completely wooded property sits at the intersection of East 120th Street and Tecumseh Road. If you're looking for a quiet place to go spend some time in the outdoors or a nice little hunting spot, on the outskirts of town, this place is for you. There are also development business opportunities with this property as well. Call Colton Cole to schedule a private showing at 405-615-7645 or shoot him an email at colton at landdoctors.com. 
and celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice-cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can join at the Palace on the Prairie at OU Athletics events at the bar at the tailgate and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit schoonerale.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. All right, things to watch for OU's offense against Arizona's defense in the Alamo Bowl. All starts with the O-line. Uh, I know that Jackson Arnold, JFA, as the uh, as the fan base seems to like calling him, that's that's what everyone wants to see. But it's up to the offensive line to protect Jackson Arnold, to get the run game going, to have this offense have some balance to put Jackson Arnold in good situations. So that's the key. And, and I think that's the number one thing to watch. Rouse, Schaefer, Everett, Matoyer, Sexton. That's what the starting five is going to look like. And these guys have been able to work together for a lot of bowl practice. I'm really excited to watch these guys play. I'm excited to see what they can do. I, I know what I'm going to get from Rouse and from Matoyer. I, I feel I like I've got a good a good idea of what I'm going to get from Sexton. But Troy Everett playing center, it's it's by far the thing, the number one thing I'm most excited to watch. What how how's everyone look health wise? Because I know uh, McKay at one point had the ankle thing. It seems like he's worked through that well. Schaefer, I know, went down late in the season. Is is everyone are we are we healthy across in those guys? Yeah, from from what I understand, they're all close, close enough to 100%. Because you're going to be at this many yeah. games in. Okay. When you're talking about the bowl game. So I I am not, uh, I'm not going to use them being banged up earlier in the year. You can't use that as an excuse. You, you've you got this, this long ramp up to this game. You got to be ready to go. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be interesting to see how they play. I, I have high expectations for them. Caleb Schaefer's played a lot of football. He hadn't played a lot of football at Oklahoma, but he's played a lot of football. Uh, Troy Everett, his best position is center. If he wants to be the center at Oklahoma next year, got to come out and play well. Arizona is, they're really solid on the interior. They're big. They got length. They don't have a bunch of first rounders on the interior of their defensive line or anything like that. I expect Troy Everett to come out and play well. So I am, I'm excited. I'm excited that a couple of those guys are getting their opportunity and I'm excited to see what they do with it. Now, when you talk about things to watch for, I'm not exactly sure how you measure this, but you got to match the juice that Arizona is going to have for this game. Mm-hmm. I, I heard Jed Fish on Sirius XM. He said they have eight guys on their team that have been to a bowl game. And they're all transfers. Like these guys are going to be really excited to play this game, especially against a team like Oklahoma. Yep. Also heard Jed Fish said that they have had some of their best practices of the entire season leading up to this game. So you better be ready to go because Arizona is going to be revved up and ready to play. So I, I expect the Sooners to have the juice as well it feels like there's a lot of positivity around the program right now with some of the guys saying that they're coming back with how recruiting went all these things and you got guys that are getting their you know getting their opportunity in this game so i expect them to match the the physicality the energy and i expect them to exceed it honestly because that's how you win a game like this tempo Arizona has had a ton of time to get ready for this game. But there's a lot of snaps on tape of them where they are not set. And it looks like they're still waiting to get the call. It sounds like Jackson Arnold has handled the tempo operation very well in bowl practice. And it's just the way that this team has played this season. With everything that's been going on with the coaches, you got to remember all the stuff that they're trying to balance in those couple weeks in December, 
it's hard to go to the team and say, hey, guys, we're just going to play super slow now. Would I like to see him mix speeds? Absolutely. But I I think you're still going to see a pretty tempo-oriented attack because it seems like Jackson Arnold's very comfortable doing it, and it's it's what they've done for the entire last, what, two years, Ted. So it's kind of hard to say, hey, we're going to change that completely for this bowl game. I just... I expect them to still play pretty fast. Yeah. And, you know, stylistically, like the tempo is, it, it's not necessarily a um, a cover or, I, I guess what I'm saying is you're still with the same group. It's not like all of a sudden you can just say, we're going to run over the top of people and go slow, like, especially patching your offensive line together. Right. You know, it's still, it's going to help you gain an edge because you're used to playing at that speed and you still right now it's, you're not going to be able to line up and just smash right over the top of people. Right. So looking at Arizona's defensive structure, four, two, five defense. Now I'd say four, two, five defense that jumps back and forth between an even four man front and then kind of an odd structure with the stand up edge guy outside linebacker type guy. Physical, tough, play with really good effort. Uh, now, from an overall talent standpoint, I would say the group is, it, they kind of remind me of SMU. And we all remember how much trouble that SMU defense uh, gave OU that day in Norman. So it is, it's, I don't, I don't think there's a bunch of high round draft picks on this defense. I do think that, some of the guys in the back end of their defense are eventually going to be draft picks. But I think that, man, they just play really good team defense. They do. Uh, I mean, they play really good team defense, and the the physical and toughness is where you want it to be. So I, I don't I don't think you have to get overly complicated, especially in the run game. So some run game thoughts. I don't think all of a sudden you've got to install a bunch of concepts that you haven't been used in all season long. I've seen teams have success running split zone against them. I've seen teams have a lot of success running different variations of counter against them. It just comes down to beating the hell out of the defensive line. It's a tough group. They're, they, are, they are not scared of the f- physical component of the game. They got good size, good length on the defensive line. Now the interior of the defensive line will get a little high. Now they're tall. They got a couple tall guys. They got a couple interior guys like six, five, six, six, but they'll get a little peaky trying to find the football and you got to be able to finish blocks when they do that. But yeah, I, I think it's going to be the core concepts that we've seen from Oklahoma this year maybe a little more QB run game sprinkled in there with what Jackson can do. Now he's got to be smart. Mm-hmm. Got to be smart with the hits that he takes, but I am, uh, I'm interested because it just, it comes down to moving the guys and straining at the line of scrimmage. And it goes back to what we started this conversation with. Hey, how does this patchwork off offensive line play? Yeah. And you know, I, I'd like to see, you know, just watching, thinking back to the Oregon State game, which was a really good game. They did a lot of stuff on the perimeter, like some pin pull stuff, crack toss stuff, maybe forcing those corners into the fit. Um, I don't know how much you saw, like if those guys don't like tackling, don't like to mix it up, which what corner really does. But um, I mean, some of that stuff is really easy to add in and, and, we seem to have, have done well with, with it at times. So I don't know, because there's going to be some wrinkles that we that we haven't seen. I mean, even if Levy was still the offensive coordinator, that's just how bowl games go. You find a couple of wrinkles that you like and, and build them in. So there'll be something there. In a shocking development, I love outside zone against this team. They, they're interior guys. They just don't play reach blocks particularly well. Is that something that we see Joe John Finley and Seth Luttrell dial up a little more than we've seen? I hope so. Cause I think it's a, I think it's a really effective concept against this defense. Now 
one thing in the running game that is very important. Where's number five? Manu, their inside backer. I can only imagine how much you love this heat seeking <laughs> missile of a human. Yeah, he's he's tough, man. He's he, tough as nails. He's not, he's not very big, but this dude brings it and he packs a punch now. Mm-hmm. If you are working to him in the run game, if you are, you know, you're double teaming a defensive lineman initially, like you better get some initial movement and be ready to come off the double team. Because this guy, when he sees it, he's coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is spiking it downhill. He is as decisive and as physical of a linebacker as OU's seen all season long. Is he the most physically gifted backer they've seen all year long? No. But when you just see him, like when he sees it, he is going to run through someone to go make the play. And you you just you have to know where he is because that's that's how he plays all the time. So that's a key. Like if you are double teaming, if you're going to Manu number five, you better you better be ready to come off your double team. And number two, you better buckle the hell up. You better tighten yep. that chin strap and be ready because there is going to be a damn collision, Ted. Yeah, uh, and I, I'm looking forward to it to see how we handle that and there's going to be some good physical challenges in there. See how we run the football. You know, we we ended the season on a on a higher note running the ball. Saw Chuck came around. See if we can keep that going. Someone's going to have to like you're going to have to block him up, and some running backs are going to be challenged to uh, to run through a tackle or two. Not only that, blitz pickup. I mean. Number five is whether, and they like to bring a lot of uh, a lot of pressure with their inside backers. From a structure standpoint, they actually it, it's very similar to what BYU played before they played OU. Like this four two five aggressive in the back end, a lot of cover one, really handsy on the outside at corner. Trust your secondary. Now, for those of you that recall, BYU came out and played an entirely different defense in that game. But that that's kind of what it looks like to me, which gets me to some, some past game thoughts. And really, I want to ask you the question. How do you think they're going to play? Because with what I've watched, they really trust their corners. And they are stupid long at corner. They got a couple corners that are 6'4". I mean, they have length and athleticism. But this is a team that's played a lot of four down and cover one and just said, okay, guys, let's get really aggressive in the back end. We trust our secondary. I look at this situation. I just, I don't know if that makes sense in this game. You've got a true freshman quarterback in Jackson Arnold playing man. Like it, it just kind of clears up the picture form and eliminates. It doesn't completely eliminate going through reads and stuff like that, but it makes the picture, it makes it easier on him in my opinion. So do you think that we could see them play some more coverage in this game and say, Hey, freshman, read it out. Let's see if you know what coverages are. Let's see if you know where to go with the ball. That's what I do. If I was a defensive coordinator calling a game and I know Jackson Arnold, maybe a little bit better than they do, but they'll, they'll get to know him uh, going back and, and studying him. Yeah. Anytime I'm facing a guy that doesn't have a whole lot of experience, what I want is to force him to take, to do a long drive, make a bunch of correct reads, correct throws, uh, the right call, whether he's handing it or keeping it or throwing the RPO. I, I'm just going to put, put it on his brain, make him think a bunch because I'm wagering that over 10 to 12 plays, he's going to make some type of mistake. Their offense is going to make some type of mistake. Now, if you want to run man coverage, in my opinion, against a inexperienced guy, I would only do it while I'm pressuring. You want to force him to pressure. You want to force pressure on him to where he's like feels claustrophobic and has to throw it against tight coverage. And knowing it's a pressure, you can have your corners play a little bit more aggressive. Knowing what I know about Jackson Arnold, I would not play 
cover one against him and rush four. Um, even if you have a spy, because I he's a really good athlete. I don't want my guys running downfield with their backs to him where he can pull it down and make a guy miss or outrun a spy guy and hit us for a 30, 40, 50 yard run. So, I mean, I'd mix it up, but ultimately um, I like, I would like double a gap pressures where you're showing it or you're bailing out. Right. Um, You know, just to put that thought in his head with direct pressure right now to speed that clock up. That's how I would call it against him. Yeah, so we'll we'll probably know in the first couple of drives kind of what their mentality is with, with how they want to play Jackson Arnold. But if they do play more zone, and maybe that includes some zone pressures, I don't think they're very good in zone. It, it seems like when their big breakdowns come in coverage, they just cut a guy loose in zone coverage. So I, I think they're at their best playing – aggressively in coverage. Does that make sense against a true freshman quarterback? I I don't know, but it, it's going to be interesting to find out. I do think the wide receivers, especially the guys on the outside, Nick Anderson, uh, Jalil Farouk, got to be ready to play a really physical game. Really long corners, like I mentioned, that are going to grab you and grab you and grab you. So you got to be able to play through that. Maybe my... Favorite matchup of the entire football game. Stoops versus Stooks (laughs) in the slot. And I think it's a tough matchup for Drake. He has been fantastic this season. But number two, their nickel trading Stooks. I like him. Physical, good size, right? 6'2", good length. Looks like he's got some long arms, uh, super competitive. So... That's going to be a fun matchup to watch there on the inside. And OU's strength as an offensive line, and I know it's a different-looking offensive line for this one, but the strength of the the offensive line this year has been pass protection. So if they protect at a high level, I expect Jackson Arnold to make plays in the throw game Yeah, with how talented he is. So... Arizona's pass rush, it comes from their edge guys. Number 11, Taylor Upshaw. It's a big, thick defensive end, man. Mm -hmm. Quick inside move, good power, can go speed to power, uses his hand well. I you look at the other defensive ends they got, what 99, 90, they're all arms and legs. (laughs) Like it's 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 clear they got linked, but 11 Upshaw is my favorite out of all of them. And their interior guys, they don't win one-on-one very often. Now, they got a couple guys that can hit you with a push-pull, just like most interior defensive linemen. But they do. They produce produce most of their rush stuff kind of twists, which it seems like some of them naturally happen. Like, it's just the two guys working off each other. But certainly, they have them called as well. So, the offense line. Got to be ready to pass off those twists in the interior. And then my last note in the passing game, it goes back to pass protection. It goes back to number five. Who's got number five? Because once again, they bring a lot of pressure with their inside backers. And he does, he also does a great job of adding to the rush late. You can call it green dog. You can call it hug rush, whatever you want to call it. He just has, he has a good feel for that situation. So the offensive line, if five is in your count, like if he's in your slide, you're responsible for him. You cannot take your eyes off him because you don't know when he's going to add to the rush. Uh, The running backs, if that's your guy, don't get lulled to sleep, man. And if he is your guy and he's coming, buckle up. Cut him. (laughs) <laughs> I've seen, don't cut him. Don't do that. But <laughs> now maybe you do it on the first one. I'll give you that. Yeah. Cut him on the first one and make him think about it the rest of the game. I can, you, yeah, you could sign me up for that. But he is going to come a million miles an hour, whether he is coming on a blitz, whether he is adding to the rush late, whoever's responsible for him. You got to know where he's at because if you do not block him, 
he is going to come and try to break Jackson Arnold's sternum with his face. I've seen him do it. I mean, I've seen him just absolutely truck some quarterbacks. Are we in for some? Because Tall Wee's playing, right? I mean, he's in San Antonio. He's in the portal, but we are in for I the the four sequels mass times acceleration on that physics problem is going to be interesting to watch. And we're going to hear it echo inside the uh, the dome down there. It's going to be, be awesome. like a shotgun going. A That'll be good. I, uh, but yeah, that's that's all I got. Unless you got anything else, OU's offense. Hey. I think we're all we're all excited to see Jackson on play, but O line play. Got to get the run game going. Be balanced. Uh, put Jackson in good situations. Yeah, and all of that said, I know we went offense and defense. I think it's going to be a fun matchup. I like it. We got to win special teams. We we have been far too inconsistent on special teams this year, whether it's just missed opportunities or giving up big plays, missing field goals. We got to be better on special teams because I, if it's a close game, and this one could be, you know how, what I always say, if it's a close game, special teams is going to decide it. Looking quickly at Bill Conley's SP Plus stuff, Arizona is 90th in special teams SP Plus ranked ranking. So I don't think special teams has been a, a big strength of that football team either. So... Yeah, we'll see. OU, though, 105th in special teams SP Plus rank. So, That's damn it, Laban, you're right. Again, it's it's going to come down to special teams just the way that we don't. I don't want to see that, but you, you've done it again. 105. It's just, it's that ain't good, man. That ain't good. It is not good. All right, let's get to call your shot. We ask you guys the number one thing you'll be watching for in the Alamo Bowl. This first one comes from Shane Smith who says solid linebacker play at Mike. It's time for Canick Kobe to step up. Stutzman's going to play Mike, right? I don't know. I don't know if, if we end, if we play the bowl game, like we ended the season, I would expect there to be a rotation at Mike Stutzman play some Mike. Uh, in that rotation and Kip Lewis come in and play some will. Now, if it were up to me, I would play Stutzman at Mike and Kip Lewis at will the whole time, or at least the majority of the time. But I don't know how those guys have come around throughout practice at the Mike backer spot. You know, I, I always say you got to try and put your best two out there. And I think the best two, are Stutzman and Kip Lewis. So, you know, we'll see. Another exciting thing to watch for. That's right. This other one comes from Boomer Zach, who says, and I love this one, if Arnold can lead Thompson on a deep ball. Prove it can be done. Do you think it can be done? Do you think Jackson Arnold can overthrow Brennan Thompson? on a deep ball. And I do think it makes all the sense in the world. They, they got these long limbed corners. Let if, if he can win at the line of scrimmage, he can run by those guys. Especially if they're going to play some man stuff, especially yeah. they're going to go cover one. I, yeah. I, I, I would use the speed on our football team totally different than we have previously. Um, I'd use Brandon Thompson way more. Uh, I'd have him run and go routes nonstop. That doesn't mean you're always throwing it to him, obviously, but it needs to be track practice for Brennan Thompson. And I don't know if it can be done or not, but Jackson Arnold's got, he's got the arm to test it. Going to be in the Alamo Dome. Yeah. Conditions won't be a factor. Fast track. Let's see how far he could throw it. Why not? I'm down. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the, is it weekend or week? Holidays? Both? I don't know. Maybe both. Our, our, our winners and losers of Christmas break. 
<laughs> but first, John Vance Auto Group has a deal for Oklahoma Breakdown. Listeners, go to any of their nine full service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. Tell them we sent you, and they'll give you five hundred dollars off. That's five hundred off just because you listen to this podcast. They've been serving Oklahomans for forty years, family owned and operated. No matter what your vehicle needs are. John Vance Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way. You can find all the information about their lifetime loyalty program, browse their entire inventory, and find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. And attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money to take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game, and with all the garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? Dirty Santa is the winner of the week. And, you know, it's uh, it's an easy way to exchange gifts. Um, you know, you just buy a, whatever you set a price range, $50 price range, whatever. And um, you exchange gifts. You play the little game. You've played Dirty Santa, right? Absolutely. How many, and, how many steals? How many steals in your Dirty Santa that you prefer? Locked after the second steal. Okay. Obviously, you can't steal it back right away if someone takes it from you. Um, yeah, pretty standard rules. So that's how we exchange gifts with the adults in our family. And the presents are usually a, the same thing. A nice bottle of liquor, um, maybe a really nice flashlight, like some scratch off lottery tickets or whatever it may be, right? That's typically how it goes. So this year I, I was going late in the action, just kind of studying things, breaking it down a little bit. I knew a couple of things that I liked had been stolen. Once I had an opportunity to lock those in, um, played it pretty safe, but, ended up just deciding to go with the uh the scratch off lottery tickets um which is the gift that i brought and i was able to steal it and lock it in with the second steal gabe it's the first time i've ever won any money on a scratch off lottery ticket and i redeemed bought and redeemed those that loves by the way um, my guy scratched off me and my son scratched it off we got a winner we take it to loves it's above the allotment that they're allowed to pay out five thousand bucks what <laughs> dirty santa huh is that crazy have you ever heard of anyone winning on a scratch off lottery ticket uh, no and I certainly haven't heard of anyone winning $5,000 in a dirty Santa scratch off lottery ticket. Let's go, man. Yeah. Luckily, I mean, it could have created an issue within the family. I think after I stole the, uh, stole the gift, but you know, everyone That's... was uh, handled it. Okay. 5,000 bucks. Huh? I am. I, I am smelling a, a sponsorship from the Oklahoma lottery now. <laughs> <laughs> you know me uh, i'm always thinking that way but yeah dude that is awesome how are you gonna spend it you're gonna put it in a roth ira come on do something fun with it what do we it, it's free money i don't know that's a good i that's a good thought i don't know what i'm gonna do i'll have to think about it you can go on a nice vacation for five thousand dollars yeah 
You can. You want to go back to Disney? Well, you can't go to Disney for five thousand dollars. <laughs> I mean, come on, what are we talking about here? Maybe one day. Maybe one day. But I hey, I thought it was awesome. I'd never I've never won anything other than like two dollars, five dollars maybe on uh scratch off lot. The funny thing is like we had I I had to read the card a hundred times. I'm like, I think I mean I think I'm one. Did, did no, you no, hand no. it to did you hand it to your son for confirmation? Like I'm seeing this right, right? <laughs> did we win? Did we win? It's funny. It was it was good because like we matched the numbers. So I was like, okay, we know we won. Let's look. So I started scratching it off. I was like, there's a zero. There's another zero. There's another zero. It was pretty cool. It was fun. That's well, I'm happy for you, man. You earned it. What a mm. what a smart steal in the in the dirty Santa situation. Well, well played, sir. Yeah, my wife wasn't happy. That's who I stole it from. Oh. <laughs> oh, that makes it so much better. I know. I know it. Who do you have as your loser of the week? I had to go with Brock Purdy. Mm. Four interceptions. Uh, a couple of them really bad. Got banged up in the football game. They got handled pretty pretty uh solidly by the Ravens who's a really good football team playing good right now and Darnold came in threw a nice looking touchdown made a couple of really nice plays and Brock Purdy was banged up all of a sudden he's over there talking to the head coach about how he wants to come back in the football game I thought that was interesting <laughs> but San Francisco man it's you know a lot of people have said Brock Purdy's not good. He's just surrounded by a really good football team. Well, I don't know if those people are right or wrong, but they, you know, they've got some uh, ammunition after that performance against the Ravens. Uh, yeah. Brock Purdy is, he's the gift that keeps on giving from a content standpoint. It's like, hey, is he the MVP or is he the guy that was the last pick of the draft and stinks? So there's like these, there's there's these two just opposite ends of the spectrum, the way that you could discuss him. And yeah, he he didn't play well. No, you're right. A couple of those, one, his arm gets hit, the other one, the batted ball. Like, okay, you know, things happen on the football field. But you know, the other two, bad mistakes. I would I was just surprised that they didn't lean on McCaffrey more in that football game. Now credit to the Ravens defense who mm. they have strung together some really impressive defensive performances against what I would consider, you know, three of the best offenses in the league. So it is, it was, it was impressive what the Ravens did now. Do I expect Purdy to turn it over four times? What well, and that Darnold threw the pick late, so they had five picks. Do I expect that to happen if those teams meet again? Let's say in a Super Bowl. No, but yeah, that was that was really impressive from the Ravens, especially that defense. Yeah, and that was like if you like watching linebacker play, Fred Warner on one side, Roquan Smith on the other. Like that is a high level. Uh, football game for linebacker and, and some good guys on the line of scrimmage too, man. That was, that was a lot of fun. I just, the turnovers were, were an absolute killer, but um, Brock Purdy, man, four in one game. That is not how you get it done. Tough. The, the only other storyline coming out of that game that will be more fun to talk about than Brock Purdy is that ref trip and Lamar Jackson for the grounding that resulted in the safety. That is an all time. <laughs> that is an all time hilarious ref moment. Oh my gosh. Did you see his face? Like they slow mode it. Oh, you could see it. It was his worst nightmare happening. And you could see the look on his face, just the sheer terror about what was about to happen. Yeah. It's one thing you backpedal and you go over backwards. Okay. That happens to officials, but, to 
know that you're going to backpedal, you're going to fall down, and it's probably going to, like, ruin the play. <laughs> That's another. Uh, Lamar Jackson was, he didn't seem too upset about it. I thought he was, because he got called for the the intentional grounding and everything, but I felt bad for the ref. Usually whenever you're, like, 30 yards deep, you're good, <laughs> you know, but that time you didn't happen to be. That was I great. I saw some people that were like, I can't, because he was kind of laughing about it afterwards. I, What is he supposed to do? Just sit there yeah. stoic the rest of the game? Like, it's funny. It's okay yeah. to acknowledge that it's funny. Now, it's not funny that it costs the Ravens two points, right? That's not funny. But the situation as a whole, lighten up, people. It was hilarious. Yeah. That and guy can't laugh at himself. <laughs> I mean, come on. They earned a safety on that play. I mean, let's be honest. That was... Uh, you know, I don't know, but that was, that was funny. That was good. I like that. Uh, that was Baltimore Ravens looking like a good, looking like a solid squad. And well, Lamar Jackson, another MVP. It's not going to be Purdy after that one. No, I Josh Allen, not going to be Mahomes. Not with the way that the, and we'll get to that too early to call it right now. Isn't it? I mean, Tyreek Hill got it. He's great. You got to just kind of see how things unfold. There's, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you on, uh, MVP. Unfortunately, don't give it out. <laughs> don't give it out yet. Don't give it out yet. But I, Lamar's got a great claim to it. I mean, it feels like the Ravens have somehow quietly put together a hell of a season with, with a lot of, a lot of other attention being thrown around and headlines with other teams, Baltimore's just quietly done their, done their duty. Ended up in a great spot. Yes, sir. All right, let's get to my winner and loser. Good first. Elevate your tailgate with Chapel Supply and Equipment in Oklahoma City. Chapel Supply and Equipment has generators and inverters on hand that'll give you all the power you need so you can take your tailgate to the next level. They've also got top-of-the-line heaters to keep you warm during those cold tailgates later in the season. They're Oklahoma-owned and operated. Elevate your tailgate by calling 405-495-1722 or visit chapelsupply.com. That's C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L supply.com. And First Fidelity Bank knows how to keep fans like you happy. With more than 50 awards in the last five years, including Forbes Best in St. Bank, the Oklahoma's Community Choice Awards, and the Journal Records Reader Rankings, it is clear that they are Oklahoma's number one pick for quality banking. And you can find that level of outstanding service in everything FFB offers. Open an account at an award-winning bank today at ffb.com. First Fidelity Bank, we go where you go. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSSAA athletics, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org financial aid is available and head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise in the best OU gear out there. That's O P O L I S clothing.com and use promo code Ted T E D for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com and use promo code Ted for 10% off buttery soft and 10% off. All right. For my winner of the week, thought about going with Baker Mayfield. Bucks are rolling, man. And, rolling. and I know that Trevor Lawrence got banged up, but I'm not crazy. He was undoubtedly the best quarterback in that football game. Yep. Confidence is there. What, they're in first place now in the NFC South. I mean, he's playing like a, you know, at the very least, what, a top 15 quarterback in the National Football League? Mm-hmm. That deal yep. that the Bucks got him for, I mean, that looks that is maybe the best contract in the NFL right now. He's, he's made it hard on him, right? He's, oh, he's yeah. made it hard on him. Like the thought there is we'll get a one year rental on Baker. If it goes bad, it goes bad. We'll position ourselves to if for this good quarterback draft class that's coming out. And if it's good, who knows? Maybe we can get uh, a nice value add here. And he's 
he's made it hard on him because you know he's going to be demanding decent money on a on a new contract and they've got a tough decision to make and hey M- mike evans is happy you're throwing him the football getting him going you got to feel good about it if you're baker and you know i don't I guess you never know when you get to the playoffs, like you get hot at the right time. Like, but I, I mean, I don't think they'll make much noise, but I think they'll get there and that's something. No doubt. I, it's good to see him healthy when he's been healthy in his NFL career, right? Especially as he got a couple years into it, been a really good player. It, it's clear to me when he's healthy, there's no doubt. He's an NFL starter. I think everyone sees that the same way now. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm excited to see how they finish the season and what they can do in the playoffs. I, I I'm just happy watching him play at a high level because he's healthy. Uh, looks like he's having fun. He's a, he's a difference maker for them, man. You can you can yeah. just tell the when when he's got it going like that swag, that confidence. It. It's contagious for an offense. So I'm I, I'm enjoying watching Baker Mayfield play football right now. I agree. I agree. And he's he, I don't know if there's any player that has that big of a difference. Like whenever you can tell he's confident compared to whenever he's not, like there's a massive change in the way that he plays and carries himself and uh it's I, I think the the rest of the team feeds off of, and that goes back to wherever he's been. You know, whenever he's in, he's in a good spot playing well. The rest of the team usually uh, starts playing pretty well around him. I've said this before, but when he's playing well, the NFL is just more entertaining. Yeah, you know, when he's right. playing well, he's one of the most entertaining player players in all football, just with everything that comes with it. So I am, I'm fired up for him, but our former employer winner of the week, the Detroit lions went on the road, beat Minnesota. in what was an awesome football game? 30 to 24 moves them to 11 and four. They secured their first division title since 1993. Crazy. I it's I'm, thrilled that they've done thrilled that they locked off locked up a playoff spot um but my god did they try to give that game away at the end what in the world i mean yeah it did not lack drama vikings convert third and 27 to extend that last drive uh justin jefferson by the way it's it's awesome seeing him back out there healthy you talk about an entertaining player. My goodness, he is. He's ridiculous. But Vikings were driving, and Lions, the Lions picked Nick Mullins off for the fourth time to seal the win in that one. And I think my biggest takeaway from this game, Ted, is Jared Goff doesn't do anything that really wows you. But that guy, he is playing really efficient football. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just, he makes good decisions with the football. He does. He's got awesome playmakers around him and, and St. Brown and Gibbs and all those other guys, but he just, he's doing a nice job getting the ball to his playmakers and not making critical errors. Like <laughs> you saw Mullins just throwing it all over the place to the other team. And you just saw Goff like, Hey, take the easy stuff, make good decisions. Don't make critical errors. I I mean, he's, he's playing good ball. Yeah. I think Detroit is just a really well-balanced football team. Um, They've got a good solid running game. They've got solid uh, weapons in the passing game. Goff is capable in the passing game. Uh, defensively, they're solid on the line of scrimmage. Good they, back. They've had play. they've had some struggles throughout the year on defense. That's that's certainly an issue, but it it's not god awful, right? Yeah, yeah. I I guess what I'm saying is like you don't. There's not one side of the ball that is just overwhelms you with how good they are, right? It's just right. they're just kind of an even kill, solid all around football team, and 
Um, it's awesome to see, man. Love Dan Campbell. He and they locked up the playoff spot and going into the locker room, he was pissed, which I can understand. Like the the penalties they had down the stretch and just the way that game ended was not good for Detroit. But they got out of there with the W and that's awesome, man. First time since ninety three. That's crazy. crazy. They're going now. The the one seed is still in play for them. H- have you seen this scenario? No. Where uh, I saw it from Peter Schrager earlier today. So here's what he said. If the Lions went out, they've got Dallas and Minnesota. If the, if the Lions went out and the 49ers lose to either the Commanders or the Rams, then the Lions will have the number one seed in a first round bye. And this is where it gets even more interesting. That could mean that Matthew Stafford could be the guy that they need to go win a game in week 18 to help them secure the one seed, (laughs) which is pretty awesome, right? And I know there's been some talk about, hey, could we get a Detroit versus the Rams in the playoff situation? But how cool would that be? Stafford has to go win it for Detroit to get the one seed. Uh, And he is, he's still beloved in Detroit. Yeah. So uh, I don't, I hope we get that scenario. That would be a lot of fun. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah. It's the one seed would be awesome. I can't imagine that place mm. host a, a, a playoff game. It's just, it's going to be, it's going to be insane. Love it for them. They're going to host a playoff game. Now we'll see if they get the buy or not. It's going to be the first time in 22 years. That wow. they've hosted 22 seasons. I mean, that you're right. It's going to be insane, but I start thinking about what the Super Bowl could look like. I don't know. Could, would I be shocked if the Lions were representing the NFC after what I just saw from the 49ers? I, I don't know, man. It doesn't feel that crazy. Yeah. I, we've seen in the NFL playoffs are crazy because. It's all so close anyways. Like, once you get in, it, there's no guarantees of, of what can happen. There's right. not. We've seen the unbeatable New England Patriots going for the the perfect season get beat by what the were, – were the Giants 7-9 and nine that year going in? Something like that? Or were they 9-7? and seven? I don't remember, but Giants just barely found their way in to the playoffs to end up winning the Super Bowl. You never know what could happen in the league. No Get doubt. hot. Yeah. All right. For my loser of the week, thought about with the, going with the NBA. Shea Gilgis Alexander and the Thunder should have been playing on Christmas. What are we doing? I and I, I saw Tim Legler and JJ Reddick talking about it on Reddick's podcast. Absolutely right. Shea was the biggest omission of Christmas Day. Now, the NFL's playing on Christmas now, so the NBA, I, I didn't watch nearly as much NBA as I normally do on Christmas because guess what I was watching? The NFL. <laughs> but it is, it's still a massive day for NBA basketball, and it leads me to a, a newfound belief. The, the NBA teams that host on Christmas Day should be the teams of the five guys that made first team all be NBA in the previous season. It should be a reward for making first team all NBA. Now there's a bunch of contract stuff that kicks in. If you make all NBA and all that, but that should be a reward. And maybe I'm only bringing it up because I think Shea Gilgis Alexander is going to be first team all NBA a lot of years over the next several years. And I would love to go to a thunder game on Christmas day, but still, I think that would be fun that if you make first team all NBA, your team, if you're still with the same team, gets to gets to host on Christmas Day. What say you, Ted Lehman? Well, I like that. You know, it's I don't know how they pick it now. Which what what all games were there on Christmas Day? How many were there? I was uh there there were five. There's five. And they they get the it's it, it really is it's kind of like a like you have to be a certain level of guy to play. Now the the Knicks always play on on Christmas but it was it was Milwaukee and the Knicks so you had Giannis it was Golden State and Denver which Mm -hmm. 
Steph Curry and then the defending champs with Jokic. You had Boston in LA. So you had LeBron, you had uh, the Celtics, who a lot of people think are the best team in the league right now. You had Philly and Miami, which Jimmy Butler and Joel Embiid both didn't play. Great job, guys. Awesome. And then uh, finished up with Dallas and Phoenix. Luca, he's wearing this. It's not quite a headband. I'm not entirely sure how to describe it. He's somehow making it work, and he is playing real well. And Kevin Durant is not happy, apparently. So what's new? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you gotta have you gotta have your best represented, and I don't know what the ratings say on Christmas Day, but you know, if there's an opportunity to have any of your like younger up and coming superstars be able to match up against some of the established guys, like you want, if it's a big ratings day, you want to expose wide audiences to like some of the new names of people that maybe don't, don't watch, you know, night by night NBA. So I, that's probably what I would do. And I think Shea fits directly into that. Completely agree. That being said, I think the Thunder will have a Christmas game for the foreseeable future. A lot of excitement around that organization, that squad. Now my loser of the week, Kansas City Chiefs. It's not looking good right now. Uh, lose to the Raiders at Arrowhead, uh, twenty to fourteen, uh, drops them to nine and six on the season. Chiefs offense looked like it had found, you know, a little bit of a rhythm. They go on the long touchdown drive in the second quarter, and then trick play goes wrong, scoop and score. Next play, you have the football on offense, pick six. That it is. It's hard to win games when the opposing defense scores two touchdowns. Yeah. And I, after that, the Raiders didn't really have to do anything. In in a shocking twist, uh, their defense flat out destroyed the Chiefs' offense. Patrick Mahomes is running for his life. Some of it is because guys are getting beat. Some of it is because he's not getting rid of the football. But it it created a a team that's usually fun to watch because they have like they look like they're having the most fun playing doesn't look fun at all anymore it looks miserable and the worse they play the angrier the sideline gets and i don't know if it's all of the success and ego or i mean there's a bunch of different things going wrong right now, but it does not look like a team that is like just seamlessly operating like they typically have. No doubt. And it's, it's just strange watching Mahomes struggle the way that he's struggling. I, it's almost like he's out there and he's unsure. It, it didn't seem like he was seeing it very well against the Raiders, but Chiefs defense continues to do their part. Yeah. Um, and yes, they could have gotten the stop late. Right. The right and credit to the Raiders. You you end the game running the football, but they gave up 205 yards of offense. Aiden O'Connell had 62 yards passing. Didn't complete a pass in the second quarter. Didn't complete a pass in the third quarter. Didn't complete a pass in the fourth quarter. And they won the game. Yeah. It's insane, man. It's insane, but it just, yeah, it just is not for, for the chiefs offensively right now. It just, it, it's not clicking. The explosiveness isn't there that we're used to. Um, the consistency, even like the off schedule stuff from Mahomes, you know, it seems like it's Kelsey or it doesn't happen at all. So off schedule stuff used to be what they just destroyed the league on. Yeah. And now it's like, they're kryptonite. I just and you know the it always comes up. Andy Reid's you know willingness to run the football. Does he run it enough? Does he not? It it seems like they're a little less versatile in their and what they're going when it comes to their personnel groupings as well. So I I don't know, man, but it just does not 
it's not running smoothly right now offensively. And you're right, man. It just you it, it seems like that has created a tenseness for that offense that you can just see watching from your couch. Yeah. Yeah. And which is it's it's such a weird thing to witness because they used to do all like almost every game they had like some fun play that you know, whether it's how they come out of the huddle or whatever it is that they're doing, where you could tell that that team is enjoying life, having fun, and it makes it makes it easy to go out and win and to play well and with everything that comes with that. It just all of it is gone right now. Yeah, all of. It. Well, on the other side of things, they have to hire Antonio Pierce, right? The Raiders have to hire him. He's done a really know. solid job with this opportunity. I, if you would have asked me, I don't know, ten years ago, if I thought Antonio Pierce would ever be a head coach of an NFL football team, I would have like, I would have laughed until I passed out. But he's done a really good job. That he gets a great response from his football team. You know, I've heard you say it a bunch teams mirror their head coach and he's tough as nails. He's no, no nonsense. And the team goes out and they, that looks like the mentality they have on the football field. So I, yeah, hire him. Can't, you can't argue with the, what the results have been. If you can go beat the chiefs in their house and not complete a pass for three quarters, then I say you're coaching pretty well. Right. I, I think so. <laughs> I just unbelievable. Uh, the well, only so other thing I have beat him in like three or four years, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. You never know with Mark Davis. I mean, you just, you never know. You, you never know what a man that wears all white and has that haircut's going to do. You just no. unpredictable. Well, all you do is you go eavesdrop at the lo local PF Changs and see what he's working on. Yeah. Then you'll know who's going to hire. Now, I I will say I I did have a nice conversation with him. We went and watched the Wings and Aces play, and I had a great conversation with him. He's a really nice guy. It was really <laughs> he was like, do you need anything? Are you having a good time? He was awesome. He really was. But I I think it's going to be Antonio Pierce. But who knows? No, Harbaugh. I, if the choices are Harbaugh and Antonio Pierce, you're you're hiring Jim Harbaugh. I mean, let's be real, but I just don't know if that's if that's on the table. Who knows? You're in two different uh, pay stratospheres there. Yeah. One one starts with one one's a single digit, and the other one probably starts with the two. Yeah, and let's be honest, it ain't gonna matter who you hire if you don't figure your quarterback situation out. Aiden O'Connell, I'll just I'll just say it. Like just looking at his face and his helmet. Don't it, it, is the helmet too small, or is the does he have too much air in the chin pads? No, it's the mustache. Is that what it is? It's, it's all just the mustache. He looks there's like a lot going on off of uh, Super Troopers. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you can't. You can't. Who wants the mustache ride? <laughs> you gotta, you gotta ditch the mustache, man. That's it. That's everything. It all starts okay. right there. What was better, the way that Hayden, uh, Hayden, Aiden O'Connell's mustache looked in his helmet, or those sweaters that Romo and Nance were wearing? Well, I can't the, believe they convinced Kurt Warner had on. Yeah, the the sweaters, it actually fits those two guys pretty well. Romo was not taking the Santa hat off. He was like, "I'm keeping this on the entire broadcast." Okay. You do you, man, in in the Christmas spirit. Oh, Good that's stuff. funny. Birthday shout outs. Happy fourth birthday to Larky Hopper. Happy seventh birthday to Bennett Barty. Happy eighth birthday to Torin Philaby. Happy eleventh birthday to Aliyah Philaby. Happy twenty third birthday to Abby Payne. Happy 40th birthday to Brian Steigers. Happy birthday to Sam Langley. 
And happy birthday to Ryan Cordell. And w- one note about birthday shout outs. The best way to get them to us, email us at the Oklahoma breakdown at gmail.com or DM our Twitter account at OK underscore breakdown. Instagram does this weird thing where I got to click like six buttons. It goes to like a hidden message file. And then you got to uh, just Twitter or X and email, please. That's the easiest way to guarantee they'll make it on the show. There you go. Just trying to trying to streamline the process for the people. <laughs> on that note, episode 382 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Thursday. We got some interesting travel stuff after the Alamo Bowl, but we'll have an Alamo Bowl recap for you guys. That'll probably be late. No, it'll be Friday. Late Friday, probably. Uh, and then our guy, Stanford Steve, going to join us to uh, preview the college football playoff and and talk about, hey, he's on college game day now, so we have questions. Mm -hmm. But just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on The Ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5 on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Hope you all had a fantastic Christmas. If you're going to the Alamo Bowl, safe travels. Have a great time. Make some noise in the Alamo Dome, people. And until next time. We appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.